Hi, everyone. Um, thank you for joining us for the uh, second Sclera Lens webinar of the year. Um, today's webinar is going to be presented by Dr. Caitlin Morrison and Dr. Elise Kramer, and it's going to be on organizing your Sclera Lens practice. Dr. Caitlin Morrison is the owner of In Focus Specialty Vision Lens, sorry, In Focus Specialty Contact Lens and Vision Solutions, which is a practice in Arizona that specializes in contact lenses for advanced ocular conditions and comprehensive care for difficult visual cases. Dr. Morrison graduated from the New English College of Optometry in Boston, and she went on to complete a cornea contact lens residency at SUNY. College of Optometry in New York City. Um, she then continued working in at New York Eye and Ear um, and before starting her practice in Arizona. She is a fellow of the American Academy of Optometry, a fellow of the Sclera Lens Society, and is a recipient of both the Burt C. and Linda M. Corwin Contact Lens Award and the Johnson & Johnson Award for Excellence in Contact Lens Patient Care. Dr. Elise Kramer is a residency trained optometrist who owns two practices in Miami, Florida that specialize in ocular surface disease and specialty contact lens design and fitting. She completed her doctorate at the op in optometry at the University of Montreal, and she completed many mission trips to really find, um, to really improve her skills in patient care and then went on to complete a residency at the Miami VA, including training at Baskin Palmer Eye Institute. She is a fellow of the Sclera Lens Education Society, where she is now also the treasurer for the SLS. She's a member of the American Optometric Association, the IACLE. She's a fellow of the American Academy of Optometry, the BCLA, and many other organizations. Dr. Elise Kramer is involved in many research publications, and enjoys lecturing around the world in all the many languages that she speaks um, and continuing to provide the best level of care for her patients in Miami. And we look forward to hearing this awesome presentation. All right, well, hi everyone. Thanks so much for having us, uh, Roxana and the Scleral Lens Education Society. Um, I'm excited to present on this topic because as we were just talking about, um, Dr. Kramer and I are both uh, little OCD business owners. And so organizing your practice to be the most functional that it can be is um, uh, passion and uh, something we find very interesting. Um, and I can't wait to hear her pieces of advice too, so I can I can um, help out my practice a little bit. Um, so, um, uh, you know, Roxana did a great job introducing us and our backgrounds, but I thought that Elise and I would just share some of our background about why we started a specialty contact lens practice and then our journey towards something, a practice that is organized and functions well. Um, you know, I have a practice in Scottsdale, Arizona. And the reason that I started the practice was because I wanted the practice to be able to function in a very specific way. Um, I think we all work at different offices and see amazing things that they're doing and then ways in which they can improve. And um, not being a business owner or having that say, you don't really get to have a um, have an impact and improve upon the things that maybe you think could be more organized or could be functioning better or systems and processes that you think would work a little bit better. Um, and so when I was actually at New York Eye and Ear, um, I noticed that a lot of people were forgetting their, um, they didn't have like a great regimen for their eye drops and they were always forgetting them. Um, and other patients were being put on dry eye treatments where maybe they didn't remember everything because it's a lot to remember. So um, systems and processes wise, I actually wrote a couple of um, systems and processes for the practice that I was in so that my patients could function a little bit better and you wouldn't have to remind them and you wouldn't have to say everything. You could hand them a sheet and it would say everything on it. Um, so when I started my practice in Scottsdale, I was really excited to be able to have a practice that incorporated all of these little small niche things that I thought were really important. Um, and in terms of the specialty lens practice portion, like um, Dr. Kramer and I do mostly specialty lenses. And so 
um, you know, when you're going through school and residency and practicing, you notice that, okay, if you're not on top of things, it could really get become haywire very quickly. Like a patient shows up and you don't have their lenses. And um, so I was like, how do I avoid this? Which is obviously very embarrassing for me if it does happen. It's only happened thankfully once in the past two years that a patient's shown up and I didn't have their lenses. Um, but that's why I started my practice for it to be able to be somewhere where I felt like I could serve my patients the best, it could function the best and be organized. Interesting um, discussion there about a patient's not coming in and, and their lenses, or patients coming in and their lenses not being there. Actually last week I had a patient come to the wrong office and their lenses were in the other office. So um, it's, you know, it's, when you have two offices, it's sometimes it's, you have the lenses, but it's just not where they thought it was going to be. And ultimately it's, it's really all about communication. But similarly, um, I think I, I always wanted to be a practice owner because I wanted to have that autonomy. I wanted to be the decision maker because I saw even in my, at school, when I was a student, I was like, oh, if I could do this my way, or um, when I was doing my externship, I was like, when I have my own practice, I'm going to do it this way instead. And um, it continued on. I actually, when I started my practice, the first one, the Miami Contact Lens Institute, I started it cold. Um, and I literally had like one patient a week. It was, I'm saying like the first two months, you know, it was very slow while I was building it and, and kind of branding it and all that stuff. Um, and I actually was doing some fill in work and I work for a group of ophthalmologists. Um, and I, you know, I saw a patient who had like, you know, mild cataracts They were seeing 2020. And I don't think there's a right or wrong to this, but I told the patient, you know, the patient was asymptomatic. I was like, perfect. I'll, I updated the, the glasses and I said, I'll see you next year. And I got yelled at by the owner, like, why didn't you schedule the patient for surgery? They had cataracts. And I was just like, I'm, I'm done. Like, I really need to just be on my own. And that's really what pushed me over the edge and also was a confirmation for me uh, to, to open my own and continue in that direction. And then, uh, slowly after that, I, I actually bought another practice and kind of merged the two and uh, having a lot of fun with it, but definitely requires a lot of organization and I'm really excited to, to share all of that stuff with you guys. Oops, sorry. I had to unmute myself. Yeah, yeah I really love, <laughs> I really love hearing all of, uh, all of that. And the origin story is so interesting about how you came to own two practices instead of one practice. Um, I also always go into other offices and I'm like, this is how I'm going to do it differently. And now that you can, and if you're a business owner listening to this, you know, that like all the things that you want to change, it comes so slowly. Um, and why I say that is this slide entirely, why is becoming organized in your practice so difficult? So you can have the most organized person in the world, but maybe their practice could run more efficiently, but it's not. And I would say that's definitely where I am. I think my practice runs really efficiently, but it can be so much better. And I know the steps to take to get to that place. Um, but I don't necessarily feel like I have the time to actually implement all the changes that I want to see. So um, there is, a, um, you know, if you go to any business lectures, they always talk about time spent working in the business versus time spent working on the business. And as a business owner um, or someone in a decision-making capacity at your own business, um, you will you find yourself quickly being dragged down by the day-to-day. The -day. You're seeing patients. You're answering patients' questions. A patient is calling with some emergency that you need to fix. Uh, lenses didn't come in. Frames didn't come in. Like today, literally before I got on this, my lab lost uh, a frame and they couldn't find where it was. And I, you know, we had to track it down. So it's definitely, um, you get bogged down in a lot of those types of things. And so when you're setting up organizational structures, at least for me, that's the working on the business. So you're actually making your business function more efficiently by putting together a lot of different, um, 
rules and processes, communicating those to your staff, which is super important. Um, and trying not to get too distracted by the day to day. If you're a private, uh, if you're a solo practitioner, especially like when, you know, Elise and I are starting out before we had associates and, um, you know, you're really, you're really the primary revenue. Uh, you're the primary revenue source of your entire company. And so you have to be working and you have to be seeing patients in order to make those, um, in order to pay your employees well and keep the business running. And so you're really like, okay, I have to be seeing patients, but like at the end of the day, what time does that leave me to actually do like the marketing and all that kind of stuff? Um, and uh, I put never done because really this process is, is never finished. Um, I'm the type of personality that thinks that it's either all or nothing. You have to like have it perfect or it's like you might as well not do it at all. And that's the wrong. Um, I've learned the wrong idea to have. Um, I really just try to tell myself that like just do a couple things every day and you will be completely fine. And in a year from now, you will be farther than where you started. Um, and so I try to remind myself of that, but it's not always perfect. I'm definitely a perfectionist as well. Um, I, and I'm not ashamed. However, I think that um, you have to know when to accept the imperfections with the idea that you always want to improve. And I think that's the, the correct way. So I don't think it's incorrect to always want everything to be perfect and always want all or nothing ultimately that leaves you leads you to continue improving um and i think yes when people ask me what are my work hours i laugh because i'm like oh, 24 7 you know like there's no more nine to five right um and i remember when i was starting out there were those Sundays and Saturday nights that I spent in the office working on the business that nobody sees, but you really have to, you know, do that. And I'm not, I had definitely have a social life and I travel and things like that, but you, you really have to uh, sacrifice some, some of your, a lot of your free time. And it's, it's ultimately very rewarding. So as uh, Dr. Morrison alluded to, I did uh, start a practice from scratch and then bought another one. So I have, I, I always compare the Miami Contact Lens Institute to like my biological child and then the Western Contact Lens Institute to my adopted child. And it's, I love them both, but in like very different ways. And I feel very differently about both. It's very strange and hard to describe, but that's kind of the best analogy I can come up with. Um, so what's, what are some differences? Well, when you start a practice from scratch, you literally have no patience. And, um, I, I mentioned before that I, I had like one patient a week. That was not an exaggeration. I literally, I was renting space in an optical and it was whoever would walk in and whatever I was getting from the small marketing I was doing back then slash like referrals, which, which was very little back then. Um, but when you buy an existing practice, you are inheriting most of the patients. You might lose maybe 10 to 20% because they might go elsewhere. Um, but you, you do buy uh, the practice based on, you know, the fact that there are patients there um, coming in and most of them will come back. Um, when you start a practice from scratch, you can literally design it however you want. You can build it out. Um, whereas when you buy an existing practices, it, it's kind of already there. You can definitely renovate, um, but it's not going to be as customized as, as if you bought it, let's say, from scratch. Um, when you start a practice from scratch, um, you might have to find staff once you start getting busier. Whereas when you buy an existing practice, um, usually the agreement includes the staff being there and staying on board. Um, so that's different, although you might not, you know, like all of them or you maybe you wouldn't have hired some of them. Most of them will stay on board. Um, when you start a practice from scratch, you can choose your equipment and uh, you can buy it new, you can buy it pre-owned, but ultimately you pick uh, your equipment. Whereas when you buy an existing practice, a lot of the equipment is already there. For example, when I brought Weston practice, the topographer was one that I just really didn't feel comfortable using, but it was there and I kind of had to deal with it at the beginning. When you start a practice from scratch, you can create your own price model. So you can just 
basically charge whatever it is that you wanted to charge. Whereas when you buy an existing practice, that might be a little harder to do. So let's say you've had patients coming in for 40 years paying, I don't know, $70 for an eye exam. All of a sudden you want to charge 150. It might be hard for some of them to accept. So that, but slowly and gradually you can uh, change these things, but it's, it's ultimately, it's already established. And same thing with practice management. When you start a practice from scratch, um, you're, you're, you can do however you want. You can start at 1 p.m., close at 10. I mean, it's your decision how how you want to. But when you buy an existing practice, the schedule is already there. Kind of people are used to the time allotted. Um, so the, the management also is, is already established. Of course, you can change these things, but it's a little it has to be a little bit more gradual rather than just doing it however you want from the beginning. So that's pretty much um, the differences I found between both. I'm curious as to whether you thought building a practice from scratch or buying your existing practice was, which one did you find was easier? I, I think, um, I think, oh, wow, that's a good question. <laughs> um, <laughs> I think probably buying an existing practice is an easier route because you have that flow already. For sure, it, it was a little bit stressful at the beginning because it was like walking into, it's like driving a new car. Like, it's like you have no idea what you're doing. Um, it's it's really kind of scary at the beginning because you're diving into the deep end, I guess. Um, but at the same time, it's like you've got the patience, you're making money from day one. Like you just, and if you're okay with those imperfections that you were talking about and kind of slowly making it your own, I think it's probably a little bit easier, but both are great and both are rewarding. So I wouldn't do it any other way, to be honest. Yeah, it's so interesting that you were able to do both. I think for me, starting a practice from scratch was really easy because I felt like for my own personality, I had more control. Mm -hmm. um, and so when I was setting it up, it was like I could keep everything. The office was, you know, the space is smaller. The overhead is smaller than it would be with an existing practice, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and that kind of allowed me to scale up in a way that felt very manageable and like controlled to me. But um, yeah, buying an existing practice would be so fun and so cool. Um, there is, uh, some, there are some fabulous business books out there that, um, I've read like a billion of them. And so if you are looking for like the next cool business book, um, and you don't have it yet, there are two. So the one that I would recommend the most is called the E-Myth. Um, I think it's by is it Robert Gerber, something Gerber, Michael Gerber. Um, and the E-Myth is, it's all about systems and procedures and what it, it they actually have a book E-Myth for optometrists. So it's geared and an optometrist and the, the, um, the writer write it together. And it's awesome because what they're basically saying is what we were talking about earlier, working on your practice versus working in your practice. And you, as a business owner, ideally you want to get out of the working in your practice as much as you can if you're truly like want to be able to scale up and scale out um, hiring awesome like associates that can do what you do um, and to do all of these things to make it so it's organized from step a to b and you're not just doing everything yourself because um i was listening to dr kramer's podcast and she was saying her her uh her practice would be very successful if she could do every single step but she can't. And so you have to rely on other people. And so how are you going to make it as close to you doing it as possible? And I think with specialty lens practice and organizing your lenses, it definitely ties into this as like, how are you actually going to get somebody else to do the job that you would have done in the same way that you would have done it? And it's basically documenting your systems and procedures. So this can be like the simplest thing ever where, um, what I'm doing right now is I am having anytime we answer a question to each other, my um, my scheduler and assistant and myself, and um, we write it down. And so that will be a question that can live on in infamy, like the answer to that question, just in case we get a new employee or have that question again and forgot the answer to it. And for the systems portion, it's like, how do we schedule a new patient? 
what kind of script do you say on the phone? Like, hey, welcome to blah, 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 or thanks for calling. Um, if you want that to be very specific and to say specific things or like, hey, your lenses are in, let's schedule you for an appointment. Be sure to wear your previous lenses to the appointment. Just things like that. You know, so many people come to their contact lens follow-ups not wearing their lenses. You know, if you work in a big practice, you've <laughs> you've had that and you're like, okay, well, I can't really see you. Um, but if you have some procedures, as soon as the your staff member sees like contact lens follow-up on the schedule, when they call to confirm the appointment, they'll say, make sure you're wearing your contact lenses for X amount of hours for scleral lenses. I'm obviously like four to six hours before you come in. Um, and that makes it a lot easier. So the E-Myth for Optometrists is a fabulous book, as is the Checklist Manifesto by Atul Gawande, which I put here. The Checklist Manifesto is basically you taking your systems and procedures for your company and making it into a checklist where um, every single thing you do can be checked off. And what they did was they implemented checklists into surgical facilities where um, they were doing fine, but they were like, how can we avoid a lot of the medical mistakes? Um, and it was just by saying like, in the surgery, um, you know, do, do this, like hand this, turn this machine on. And it was like everything you would go through naturally in your head, you just write it out and do a checklist and then nothing kind of gets lost along the way. Um, and so this is something that is an, such an active process of what I'm doing now. And we have so many procedures. And once we're kind of, I feel like we're at a finish point, we'll get them all printed out um, to give to everybody and like bound up. But right now we're still working on like, what are those procedures? And you can, if you're reading it and you're like, well, this doesn't make sense. You can eliminate a lot of the waste. Um, and this is key, key, key to get your, getting your staff involved. And this is something that I've been, um, I just have, I've been having them write the systems and procedures and it's been working out really well. And we just keep the systems in a Google drive that we all share on the same email. And it's so easy. And if one of us sees like, oh, okay. Um, I need to yeah, schedule a patient for this date, um, then they have the procedure in there of like exactly how to schedule this type of a patient or like what the fees will be, et cetera. Yeah, delegation, the power of delegation is huge. Um, I think that if someone can do something 51% as well as you, like it's it's a go, you know what I mean? Uh, it allows you to focus on other things and, and uh, that's very powerful. For sure. So um, we are talking about organizing lenses in the office, and that is going to help ultimately minimizing losing lenses, um, locating lenses when patients arrive, um, and then tracking. That's a big one. How many times do patients call and ask where their lenses are? Um, I'm sure you have that all the time, Dr. Morrison. Yes. <laughs> So it's important to have a system where um, you can track. So basically every time I order a, a lens, I will uh, write it down, uh, the date I ordered, and I will write which lab I ordered it from. And then I will have my manager uh, eventually follow up and then put down tracking information. And then she will later, and then we'll discuss that in upcoming slides, but she will eventually share that tracking information with the patient. So that uh, avoiding those calls, because by the time people call, they're frustrated. How do you do it? Yeah, um, yeah, sa same kind of thing. And, and I am really interested to see your exact tracking system. Um, we don't do anything with the tracking numbers because I feel like sometimes it's hard to get. So I'm interested to see like, if you have, do you call out for your tracking numbers? Like call the lab and ask like, hey, can you send us the tracking number or does it come automatically? So I order, I actually order all almost, I want to say 99% of my lenses. I order them by email um, or electronically. I don't call. Um, I just find staying on hold extremely frustrating and it's, I have zero patience. So basically what I do is I will order the lenses and I have my manager confirm that it was ordered because it's happened before that I ordered something and the consultant or, or representative missed it. And so, and so then what happens is um, that I have someone confirm it 
And then, you know, it takes a few days to manufacture. Then once it's sent out, they generate a tracking number. My manager obtains that tracking number and then shares it with a patient. And what ultimately what that does is they feel like they're getting a good service without even asking for it. And if they were about to call, it avoids them calling the office, leaving the line open for people who need appointments or have emergencies. And uh, it allows them to track it, you know, and you can see, are, is it go, you know, is it coming? When was it delivered? And then, you know, it, it allows to avoid a lot of issues. So that's pretty much what we do. I, once I order the lens, I'm done. I, and I write it down on the spreadsheet, I'm done. So, yeah. I love that. I love that. We need to get better at the tracking numbers for sure, because people do call in and ask about it. And then we have to go and obtain the tracking numbers. Um, and we ship a lot of lenses directly to the patient just for convenience sake. And so that would be really nice to just do automatically. So I'm definitely going to start doing that. Um, my system for organizing patient lenses in the office is that once the patient, um, once the patient lenses arrive to my office, um, I not only log them into the EMR system and I just put a note in their chart, lenses arrived so that my scheduler knows that the lenses got there and so they don't schedule or confirm an appointment because we have patients pre-schedule um, that lenses aren't there for. So we do that first. Um, we do put them into our tracking system so we also know that they arrived. Um, when they arrive and you'll see this a little bit later but we always like look at the invoice and put in the um the charges just to make sure we're all on the same page and um taking care of that like make making sure you're tracking shipping as well because shipping can can get to be a lot if you're ship especially if you're shipping directly to patient that two times can add like an extra twenty dollars onto your your bill which is something to just know of as a business owner it's not a big deal but something to just know um and so when they come in, I also put them in a clear baggie and I mark them with the patient's name. And then we put them into a, a bookcase that I have that I'll show you a picture of in just a second. And it has um, a lot of, uh, it has their initials like on it. And so the patients will go into this box and then when they come in, we'll just go right to their um, lenses and get them for the, for the day of. Um, I would say that once you see my system, you'll notice that you might, if you're in a larger, like a large, large, large practice with many doctors or a school environment, um, if you're in a school, you're probably not listening to this, <laughs> this presentation about a private practice, but um, if you are and you need to scale it, that's so many more patients, so many more, so much more volume that maybe you'll have to get something that's a little bit larger. And so on the next page, so if you look onto the left, you see that these are, we um, grouped all the patient's last name by like A, B, C, D, I'm looking at it right now, E, F, G, H, um, and then the one, you know, the one on the bottom is like X, Y, Z. And so all the patients who have those last names will just go in there in their clear baggies with their names on them so we can just pull them right away. I got these boxes from Michael's and they're awesome. There's also ones at Ikea that are very inexpensive, but they look cute. Um, and you can just put everything in. If you're in a large practice or school, you would obviously need to be doing like A, B, another box, C, D, E, F, because you're just going to have so many more patients, but you might also have like a large turnover of those lenses. So perhaps not. Um, so we'll see, you know, that's just something to think about. Um, there are other ideas that I got from, I think it was a previous thread on business of scleral lenses on Facebook about how people organize their lenses. And these were awesome uh, pictures that I just found online. So just to give you some other ideas, instead of keeping them in boxes like I do or using them how um, Dr. Kramer does, but this on the left is not specialty lenses, but this is soft lenses. And I just added it because like, look how beautiful this is. I would love for this to be how my office looks with built-ins and, um, and just having like maybe drawers with the, with the last names on them. Like that would be so gorgeous. Um, but maybe on my next location, I will definitely do that. Um, on the right hand side, um, this was a image I pulled from Hawkman family eye care, and these are pharmacy bags. And so they're clear bags. Um, and you just will put the patient's name and information. I always put the invoices in there too, because then you can have all the information for your EMR if you didn't put it in already. Um, and then just put the patient's name on them, have A, B, C, D, and then just pull them out really easily. 
Um, I did find them here for you online, just in case you were interested. I think this is a little bit better for maybe a higher volume practice, but additionally buying these, um, buying these baggies and the system would probably cost you more than getting just using the plastic baggies that are given to you. What I use is the plastic bags that we have. They're just bags that we get from, we order our lenses on WVA and they just come in plastic baggies already. So it's like, we just use those, put the patient's name on them. And then I print sends out baggies and, um, you know, some other labs send out little clear, clear baggies. So we just use the same baggies and we just reuse them, um, you know, because environment. Um, and this, uh, is a, picture of, um, using those prescription bags. If you wanted to, it looks like you can get, um, uh, 15 bags for about like $30. So it's about $2 a bag. So it is a little bit more expensive. And then this prescription bag cabinet is something that you could purchase if you didn't want to make your own. Um, it's like seven fifty. So if you just wanted to like an easy, quick solution, like maybe this could be an option, just a little bit pricier, but maybe something that you find more interesting. This was some, uh, this other idea is something that a lot of people mentioned online as the way that they organize their lenses. And it's buying these small pharmacy paper bags and then putting lenses into those bags and then just putting the patient's name on the front and organizing them somewhat on the left in terms of their last name. Um, these are very cheap. You can get a thousand bags for 50 bucks and you can just keep them in whatever way works for you. You could even keep these baggies in just a little box. You keep them in a file. I think file cabinets, you would probably just have too much like of a, of a volume for, but, um, this was another, uh, cool idea that I saw and might be a good option just depending on what your space, um, what your space looks like. For sure. Um, I love those. And so basically, this is a couple of things I wanted to show you. First of all, when we receive uh, lenses, the patient does not have an appointment yet. Um, and the reason we do that is actually to avoid patients coming in and their lenses not being there. We found that that has been better because and some patients do pre book and usually we do have the lenses in, but it has happened that we haven't. And so um, we usually have space and ultimately for a follow-up, it doesn't take that long. So we can usually fit them in pretty accordingly. The only time that we really, really go out of our way to schedule patients, you know, uh, in advance is basically when, uh, we're getting their, they're an out of town patient and we're getting their lenses next day type of thing. So wait, hold on one second. Sorry about that. So um, basically what you see here on the left-hand image is how we organize the lenses in the office. Um, in, in bins, we put the patient's name on the trays and then we have them there for when they come in. We also likewise send a lot of patients their lenses via mail and uh, they will get their lenses at home. The bin that you see on the right side is a bin where we keep all the lenses of patients that are there in case they decide to cancel the fit and we have to return the lenses. So that's important because a lot of labs will require you to send those lenses back and we keep them. Also, we don't want to have patients to have the wrong lenses or spares or it happens that patient says, well, I like the last one better or the first one better that you sent. So then we have it there and then we keep it there for them. And then it, it happens that if they do cancel the fit, then at least we have all the lenses set up and we can send, we can ship them back. Yeah. I think this is like such a great idea, um, with keeping the lenses, the old patient's lenses somewhere. Um, I wasn't really requiring patients to bring them back in because if they ended up canceling, I would just ask them to bring them all back in, but patients do lose their old lenses. Um, and so if you do have to do a return, they likely won't have them. Um, and also sometimes it can get very confusing. Like the patient has multiple lenses and they're like, I don't yeah, know which one I put in my eye. <laughs> up all the time, all the time. Yeah. So, and then you have to like go use the radioscope and you're like, how do I do this? I, 
wasn't, I'm not very good at it um, <laughs> or whatever you may do, but, or look at the little numbers on the lens, which are the um, sometimes serial numbers. So um, I definitely am trying to get better at that. So this is something that I'm going to, after I saw this, I was going to implement as well, just having them bring them back. And again, with your systems and processes in place for organizing your staff, you can also remind them if they're, if the patient's there for a dispensing, and this is like their second pair of lenses, your staff can say, oh, remember to come in with your old lenses and bring them in for the doctor, um, just to remind them when they're coming in to bring in all the old lenses. Yeah, so I wanted to talk to you a little bit more about my tracking system. So basically when, as I mentioned, I order the lens, I write down right away the patient name, and then I put down the date ordering, the date I ordered, which lab I ordered it from, what type of lens it is, and then I'm done. After that, everything is delegated. My manager will call, um, confirm that the order was placed and received, obtain tracking number, get a status like an ETA, share that status as well as the tracking number with the patient as soon as it's generated, and then also write down the warranty date so the patient knows that. Then what she'll do is she will also scan the invoice into the chart so that as soon as a lens comes into the office, if it does come into the office, we remove the invoice because we don't obviously want patients to have that in access to that invoice. It's, it's just for uh, information on the back end. And uh, we have it there in the, in the, in, in the patient management or the EHR software. So that if I need to see it, if I want to check the warranty data, I want to check the parameters, everything is there. And that's pretty much uh, what happens. And in the notes, sometimes I will write urgent need tomorrow, and then she'll make sure that it goes out um, or urgent need like next week or needs to be shipped to the patient. You, you were talking a little bit about shipping before. I do think that shipping is a huge expense, especially when you increase volumes. So one thing, if you are shipping lenses to your patients and they're out, like you're shipping lenses to your office and then you're shipping lenses to your patient, that's double shipping. And that's easily more than $20 sometimes. So that adds up for five patients, that's $100 and so on. So you really want to charge patients if you are shipping. If they're asking for overnight, you need to charge for that because the labs will charge you sometimes $35 for that. Um, so so those um, that, that information needs to be provided and also you need to know where you're shipping to to avoid double shipping um, if you did make a mistake and you ship the lenses to your office by accident and you were supposed to ship to the patient well that's a mistake but if the patient wants a lens shipped to to the office and then they change their mind they need to pay for that and that's how we do it yeah that's so that's so interesting to hear about charging shipping. I really haven't been charging patients to ship to their houses, but I also haven't, I pretty much do it just directly from the lab. So have the lab ship directly to them. Do you, do you have all of your lenses come to you first and then you ship them out or do you do them sometimes from the lab directly to the patient? I do it from the lab to the patient most of the time. If they know how to put the lens in and take it out, 99% of the time it's going to the patient because one, it allows them to put the lens on before they come in to see me. And so that four to six hours there that you were talking about before, that's already there. Second of all, um, it allows them to try it for a few days and really give me good feedback. And the other thing is it avoids when we were like in the middle of COVID, which we still are, but when we were really like, when it was crazy, we wanted to reduce the amount of people in the office at the same time. And so we've just kept that and we just shipped to everybody. So unless they really just don't know, they've never worn scleral lenses before, then we have them shipped to the office. We dispense and train, uh, or we train and dispense. And then, um, and then after that, we, we see them and then uh, we modify and, and see them at their follow-up. But all modifications are sent to their home unless for they have a P.O. box or unless they they're from out of town or or they specifically request to have it shipped to the office for any other reason. 
Yeah, I do the exact same thing for the exact same reason is because it avoids a lot of my time. I don't have the patient sit in my waiting room for 30 minutes to an hour to let the lens settle and then and then look at it and then make adjustments. It's just I don't have time for that. Um, and so I can obviously think about like, oh, if the if a scleral lens settles by about approximately a hundred microns over four to six hours you know, it's going to look like this, but if you, if you have a lens and you can ship it just a modification, just ship it directly to the patient, then they, when they come in, they can give you all that feedback. Then it's already settled. For example, for example, my dad, um, has scleral lenses and he didn't come back for two months because he was the worst patient. And, um, I kept telling him, come back. I need to look at your lenses. When I saw him for his lenses, his lenses were completely touching the cornea. And I felt so bad (laughs) because it's my, but it's my dad. So I fixed it and it was all fine and he's fine. Um, but if you can imagine if that was a patient, at least then I would know, I had no idea it was going to settle that much on him. So he's just a really hard settler. Um, The, uh, you know, we've discussed a little bit of the importance of tracking, but mostly it's just to avoid a lot of like your headaches. And when patients call in asking where things are and, um, for, for me, it's also a great chance to keep track of a little bit of just bookkeeping, not like on the books technically, but just like in my head, like, okay, approximately if I do a lens fit, that's this lens, I approximately see the patient this amount of times. Um, the shipping is approximately this amount. And so over the years, you can actually look at, you know, what, how many lenses are you ordering? How many follow-ups do these patients generally have? How many lenses are you ordering? Um, I know exactly how many lenses I order per patient approximately. Um, especially like you're talking about, we are perfectionists, so it's usually not a one and done. I, I know they would love that, but it's not that way with me. Um, and, uh, And then just seeing like, okay, I'm actually spending about this much in, in, uh, in shipping fees. Like maybe I should increase this cost or like Elise was saying, like maybe if a patient wants something specific, like maybe charging them for that, that's a great thing to keep in mind. Um, and so, uh, you can use a lot of different things for this contact lens tracking system. I think yours looked like it was on Excel, but maybe it's your EMR, um, Mine is, I tried Excel at first. Oh yeah, at least, you know, do you know which, what was you using? Mine's a Google document and it's a spreadsheet. It's a Google sheet. So yes, it is Excel, but it's on Google Drive and that allows me, my associate and my manager to update the information in real time. So that that's important. And you were talking to, you were alluding to Google documents before when you're talking about your systems and processes. And I think, yeah, I think it's much better than Excel. Yeah, absolutely. I use Google Drive for like so many things, obviously not HIPAA information, but I use it for so many different things. And um, and the great thing is that we have one email and all of my staff checks it for me. And so I don't have to check it. And also on that drive, we are, all have access to the same thing. So yeah, it's great to use an Excel document, whether that's an Excel that you save on your computer, probably not something that you do in Google drive. You can also use your EMR if your EMR are as good at tracking these types of things, but perhaps it is, perhaps it's not depends. Um, and then third party systems you can use as well. So this was an example of my, um, Excel spreadsheet when I was using one. And I, I think I also did this on the Google drive. And so, um, I just basically put arrival date, date ordered, um, if we're doing like second and third orders ship where you ship it to, um, the patients, uh, you know, first initial last name, or you can, you know, do initials, whatever kind of keeps it a little bit more compliant, um, company that we ordered from what type of lens we used, the cost of lens shipping, cost of goods, cost of patients, and then revenue. You can keep track of that or you cannot. It, I mean, you can keep track of that in any sort of way. It's just nice to know if you're like, Oh, you know, GP lenses have gone up in cost quite a bit over the last three years I've seen. Um, and so the GP lenses, it's like what you were charging patients prior is probably not enough now when you account for all the shipping. And then if you use a lab that charges you per lens, you know, you could just lose money on every GP that you order. So just some things to be nice to know, like 
you know, just look at them over the course of, um, course of time. And then invoice numbers for reference. That's always nice. Just in case one of your staff members is calling. And also an example is this is another third party service that I started using actually instead of the Excel spreadsheet. Um, and this is called monday.com. Um, it's one of the many, it's like a sauna and different organizational um, programs. If you only use one login, then you can get it for free. Um, but if you have multiple people on it, you can get it through other things. If you can see on the left-hand side, um, we just use it for like, I have goal tracking. So a lot of my, um, all of my staff can see like, are we meeting our goals for the, for the month? Um, I have order tracking, contact lenses, glasses, um, people who call in for like long distance consults and different things like that. But you can see over here, you can make these, like, you can basically make this, uh, little chart, say anything that you want. So, um, I have all the contact lens ordered and then I have a thing, um, below it that said ordered. So as soon as I ordered it, I just drag it down. Um, and then once we get the lens in, then we can put in, um, all the other information. So that's really helpful too, especially if you're looking for like one place for your, all your staff to be looking and your EMR doesn't really work for that. Monday.com is really fabulous. Um, and, uh, so far so good. Like I was mentioning also, I do like log in arrivals, et cetera, contact the patient, make sure the patient's aware of their warrant, aware of their warranty, just because, you know, they could be way outside the warranty and just like never coming back for their follow-ups. And then you've lost that time. So that's great to let the patients know as well. Um, this is my conclusion slide, because I don't know if any of you are online and seeing these incredible, um, incredible uh, kitchens and um, fridges that are organized amazingly. And I am currently trying to do this with my fridge, although it does not look like this yet. Um, but if you want your practice to be as organized as this beautiful fridge, um, really my advice is just, I am doing the best that I can do the best that you can one thing at a time. Trial and error is so huge because when I try, I try one thing, we were trying all everything on Google drive for a while and it wasn't working. And my staff was kind of getting like, Oh, there's too many places to look. And that's when I started the monday.com. Um, but there's lots of ways that you could do it. Just try it and see what really works for you. And then and then uh, if it's not working and then move on and, and a great place to start is asking your staff, like, is this, is, is this working for you? Or are you feeling like this is organized? I ask them that all the time because I don't want them to just be slogging through something and then it's not efficient. Um, and they actually told me at our last, our last meeting, they were like, listen, your EMR is not good. And so you don't have to change it, like do whatever you want. But in the future, if something comes along, um, then you might want to consider it because it's, it's been really a big hassle for us, especially as we're growing and getting so much busier and we have so many more patients just using it day to day is, is not working. And so I took that to heart. And the next day I had a call and now we're implementing a new EMR system because I don't want a day to go by that they feel like the, what they're using on a day to day basis is really horrible. Yeah. So I don't, <laughs> I don't know if you had any conclusions, Elise. Yeah, well, ultimately, when you are delegating, the people you're delegating to have to be okay with the system, right? Uh, one thing that we saw in the spreadsheets was that it was just getting really, 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 really long after a while. So I had my manager start as soon as it, you know, the patient's lens was delivered, we have it closed. And so I think it's important to close and eliminate so that you keep it short and concise. And that allows you to have it to organize your organization. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think, you know, every, ultimately everyone's going to come up with their own way, but your staff being happy with the way the system work is, is very important as well. Um, and delegate, delegate as much as you can. Um, your job is to design the lens and fit it and do doctor stuff and not so much about, uh, you know, actually you know, ordering and making sure it's there and making sure it's received and, and all of that. Yep. Every, every time you take a little bit of time away from that is time that you probably could spend doing something different. And that's much more, um, it's much more, uh, 
that's better for your company to basically grow and reach new heights um, and, and fit more lenses and, and look at your, your processes and be like, oh, if I'm spending, you know, three, if you, if I'm seeing a patient for a, a five follow-ups or whatever, like, how do I get them to three follow-ups? Like that's all, that's your kind of stuff. And that would be nice to know. Cause it just like really helps you out with your overall business. So, um, thank you so much everyone for attending our, our lecture and just musings about organizing your practice. Um, and, um, here are our contact information and, if, I guess you can open it up Roxana to any questions if anyone has any. Yes. Thank you guys. This is an awesome lecture. Like as y'all were going, I was like, I can do this in my practice. I can add this. So definitely some great tips to have. Um, we do have a couple of questions that have come in one couple of questions are about the tracking. So I guess people had some questions about if, you know, at least for your practice, if you send the tracking for final lenses only, or if it's for, if it's direct mail to patient, or if you also send invoice, not invoices, I apologize, um, tracking information for the final lenses, the direct mail patient or direct to patient lenses, or any lenses that you order, if you send the tracking info for all of them. I send tracking information for all the lenses, not just the final one, every single exchange, every single lens uh, that's being, that's being done. Okay. Awesome. And then I don't know if y'all would be able to answer this, but there's a question on how would you evaluate a practice when you were buying it? What is a good price? Uh, so but I, guess I saw that question earlier and um, I think it, it, it depends on obviously the gross income and it's hard to say what a good price is, but ultimately I would recommend getting a consultant when you are looking to buy a practice, especially one that specializes in eye care optometry and they can help you do the numbers and see if it makes sense. Um, but, uh, there's no like price a point for that. It really, de it really depends on the numbers they're generating and also, um, a lot of other things. So definitely hire a consultant for that. Yeah. I think in the book that the e-myth book that I was recommending, they actually talked about buying and selling your practice. Cause really, you know, what you might be doing is, is creating a practice that eventually you would want to sell. And if you have really good organization and systems and processes written out so that anybody can come into the position and do that position just as well as the previous person, because it's all written out for them. Their knowledge doesn't leave when they leave the practice. Um, it makes your practice a lot more valuable in general. So I've never bought a practice, but that was a, a cool tidbit that I took away. I was like, oh, okay, I could make a little bit more processes and it would probably be beneficial. Awesome. No, it's actually something even I'm doing where like I have a new staff person, like anything I teach you type it out so that if you want to refer to it or that anyone else comes, they can refer to it. So it's always good little tips to have. Um, another question here was about once you're done with a fit, what do you do with all those old lenses? Do you use them as trials? Do you just throw them away? How long do you hold on to them for? Um, as Katie, what do you do with yours? Yeah. So my, my stretch goal is to take all the lenses and, and with known parameters and put them into something where I can, I can use them for future fittings. But to be honest, I don't know if I'll ever do that because I feel like if you put a diagnostic lens on, you can get so close to the final product right away that it's, it's not like it's extremely needed unless a patient is like, they have an extremely toric sclera and they, you know, you want to try on like a flat 10 steep 12 or whatever, um, that might be nice to have, but I don't know if it's worth my time to organize them. So I really just have them in the office and sometimes I like take pictures of them and maybe I'll do something. I don't know. What do you do, Elise? I, once the warranty is over and the patient decided to keep the lenses, which is most of the time, um, I actually discard them and I recycle them. We recycle. Um, but, uh, if the patient does cancel the fit, as I mentioned before, um, I do send the lenses back, uh, to the lab and that's pretty much how it works. I, some patients will, let's say they got, they ended up with a multifocal pair, but there's also a distance pair that was made. So I sometimes let them keep the distance pair for like a smaller fee type of thing. Um, but that's, that's pretty unusual. I would say most people just finalize with one pair. Okay. 
Okay. And then um, there was a question here about when labs do ship directly to patients, do they omit pricing and invoice information? I believe that answer is yes for the ones that I've worked with where they ship directly to, if you let them know that it's going directly to the patient, not to your office. But has that been y'all's experience as well? All the time. They just send a packing slip, if anything. Um, and the, some patients like to know their parameters, but they don't put any pricing information. That's uh, I've never had a lab mess that up, by knocking on wood, though. <laughs> yeah, I've never heard of any anyone knowing the the price, but also usually the price only comes on the first pair of lenses that you would die, you would dispense yourself, not on the secondary one where it's only the shipping information, even if they got the wrong information. So I don't think it's something to like be worried about. So we have a couple questions on the EMR EHR systems. Um, someone wrote that their EMR system is not very specially lens friendly and how you guys choose to document your lens parameters. If you type it directly into the EMR, if you manually type it in, or if you do photos and scan the information in. Um, I mentioned before, we have the invoices scanned in to the patient's um, profile. So I can easily look them up. I can print them and things like that um, for detailed parameters. But for, um, you know, the, I have a, a free type EHR. It's called Practice Fusion. It's not um, optometry specific. It's actually med just for all of medicine. I do have some optometry templates, but it allows me to do a lot of free typing and just put in, uh, you know, the exact parameters rather than clicking on different boxes type of thing. Yeah, I, I do free type the parameters just because that's how my EMR is set up. I don't have anywhere to put in specialty lens parameters. Um, the EMR that I'm gonna be switching to does. And so you can basically create a template and then put in all the additional information. Um, do I do that every time they come in all the time, especially with a, like a free form lens where you don't really know a lot of the parameters? Um, no, I usually just put like what I did and then whether the, what complaints the patient was having last time and whether those were resolved or not. Um, and then I always figure like I can look them up in the future, say a patient wants to order another lens two years from now, this, the lab will still all have that information. So I'm not super stringent about it. Maybe I should be never lose the information, but they never have. So. So we're also getting a lot of questions about, you know, what EHR system you guys would recommend or what y'all are using. I don't know if y'all want to answer that question. <laughs> you guys maybe can say what you guys recommend or systems that you guys have seen that you guys have liked. I mean, I mentioned I use practice fusion. Um, I love it, but I've been using it for 10 years. So maybe it's just, I'm used to it. Um, it's just very friendly to the um, to free typing, which is ultimately the easiest for me, I've found. Um, my staff seem to like it, and then they have a different system called My Vision Express for patient management. My Vision Express, that's interesting. Um, I don't... Uh... Uh, I don't have necessarily a recommendation just because I am in between ones. Um, I am switching to crystal because a lot of our specialty lens colleagues mentioned that it was, um, good for specialty lenses. And really, because I don't really see comprehensive patients at all in my practice anymore, I just see specialty lenses. I don't really need a lot of the other stuff. Like I don't need a visual field area. I don't need any of that kind of thing. And so just having like one template that just says everything on it, where I can input my specialty lens parameters and then have everything is very beneficial for me. So I'm going to try it out and then, and then see how it goes. Hopefully. Well, awesome. Well, yes, keep it. We'll have to keep you, keep us posted on our next webinar, going over practice management stuff and seeing how it goes. This will be our, I think our last question for the night. Um, any advice or tips for a new grad trying to start a contact lens based practice? Um, just do it. Uh, you know, uh, believe in yourself. It's, it's hard to get carried away by, you know, getting hired by, let's say, a corporate optometry and they there's no room really to, to specialize in those places so if that's really something you want to do um, definitely do it follow your heart 
and find the right space for you. Market yourself, um, speak to all the ophthalmologists in the area and, and get yourself out there. And definitely, um, you know, if you are fitting scleral lenses or interested in fitting scleral lenses, get involved with the Scleral Lens Education Society. It's probably the best place to start. Um, you know, members membership is free and you get so many resources, so. Yeah, agreed. That's that's great. And that's great advice. Um, the advice I would give you is just figure out exactly what you want your practice to look like and how you want it to run and how you want yourself to feel while you're in it and your patients to feel. And um, don't deviate from that unless you're trying it out for six months to a year and nothing's working. Um, but, you know, if you have a real vision for something, you can ask a lot of people a lot of advice of which we're giving you advice now. So take any advice, even ours with a, with a grain of salt and just do things the way that you want to do them. Not the way that other people tell you it has to be done because it's not true. It doesn't have to be done in any specific way. Um, I started out in a new city. I, I'm from Arizona, but I didn't live here for the past eight years. Um, I started out in a new city and I didn't know anybody and I didn't have a referral network. Um, and I just did what Elise said. I marketed myself and, um, you know, knew about a lot about lenses. So as long as you know that, um, you're in, you know, a good space. And I kept my space really small and I kept, I only bought the pieces of equipment that were awesome and that I really needed. Like I felt I needed the Pentacam and I got that. Um, and, uh, keep everything, like keep your overhead really low at first so that you can grow in the way that you want to, not the way that you feel like you have to because you have so many expenses that you need to be paying for them. If you really want to go down the specialty lens route and do specialty lenses only, that's always a great thing to do because you can always get a new space, get more staff, like be bigger. Um, but if you keep everything at the beginning, when, you know, Lisa's saying she had one patient, I mean, mine was the same. If I got like a few, a handful of, of specialty lens patients a month, I was like, oh my gosh, I'm doing so well. Um, and so if you, if you want to do that, just keep everything really manageable. So when you are paying your monthly bills, you're like, wow, I'm like, I got a couple lenses and like, now I'm doing really well. And then in the future, you know, you can, you can just scale. Well, thank you guys both for joining us tonight, for putting on this awesome webinar. I know I'm taking away a ton. I'm writing notes right now while y'all are answering questions. So it's, it's always great.